Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours, the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., broadcasting to you today from our Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona. I'm your host, Joe Puzz, PMO Joe, and for the next hour, we'll be talking project management with our special guests. I also want to say thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad. The PMO Squad is home of the Purpose Driven PMO. If you're looking to build a new PMO or your current PMO is struggling, visit www.thepmosquad.com to learn more about their purpose-driven PMO and proprietary PMO approach. So before we get started with our guest today, I, I you know one of the things I do uh, on a fairly regular basis is I always go back to my calendar and go to a year from today in the past. And what was life like then to reflect on how things are going today? And it amazes me often how it doesn't seem like it was a year ago that something happened. It seems usually it's like, wow, that seems like maybe just a couple months in the past. But today we're, we're essentially one year from when this all started. And I don't, I don't know how that happened so quickly, right? So this, I think is our 23rd episode. We've had guests from across the U.S. and Europe. We've had sponsors from Europe and the U.S. We've had PMI uh, representation on. We've had local consultants on. We've had international consultants on. The amount we've accomplished in one year has been inspiring to me to continue to keep going forward because I know we're just scratching the surface. But it's also been a great testament to our guests and our audience that they're staying power and that this platform is working and it's giving a voice to those within our community to be able to talk project management, the value we provide. And that's really the reason why we're doing the show. So one year in, I'm amazed and I can't wait to see where we go from here. So with that, let's uh, talk to our guests. Who, who's on with us today? We First, we have Dale Richards from Swattage and John Bailey from PMI Phoenix. So Dale, I want to say welcome And if you could take a moment to introduce yourself and share your story here with our listeners. Thank you. And thanks for having me. And by the way, congratulations on one year. That is amazing. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, a year of contributing to the the PM profession and to the community. That's fantastic. My name is Dale Richards. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Swattage, the Project Innovation Lab. And... um, uh, swattage, in case anyone's curious, it's a mashup of the words SWAT, as in a SWAT team, and wattage, as in applied power to get work done. I created this company because uh, the the market where I'm living and working, there's a lot of there's a lot of companies here of all sizes uh, that I feel like can, could benefit from PMO and project management and project portfolio management. And so, but I wanted to create a company that was unique in its ability to understand more about the business environment in which the project managers are working. Uh, and I, I wanted to be able to bring tools and, and, and techniques and uh, to, to those PMs so that uh, they could kind of see more about what's going on around them because I didn't really have that. You know, I would, like a lot of people, I was a, an accidental project manager. I kind of fell into the profession. I didn't necessarily have a lot of business or leadership skills. I had to kind of build those as I, as I went along. And so I wanted to create a company that could help others kind of get ahead of that, of that learning curve. So Swattage is, um, we, so we, we uh, innovate in consulting methods to understand what's going on in the project environment. We innovate um, in training and, and methods. And we also innovate in technology. We have a, a, a New product called the uh, called Circuit. It's a project management. It's a project portfolio management app that's designed around the sponsor first as the primary audience, rather than around the um, the project manager. And it's designed to make the collaboration between the sponsor and the project manager more. Um, uh, it's designed to create a more collaborative relationship between those two people. So that's a little bit about me and Swattage. Great. Thanks so much, Dale, for being on. Uh, and, and I was always curious about the name Swattage, so thanks for, for giving us that uh, story as well. 
Sure. Our other guest, John Bailey, is with us. John's a repeat guest. Thank you so much for coming on. Mm-hmm. I, I know it's very important for me to ensure that we're plugged in with PMI, both locally and nationally. And uh, what a pleasure now to have you back in the studio with us. So if you could take uh, a moment you. to reintroduce yourself to our guests as well. Uh, certainly. Uh, my name is John Bailey. I am currently the past president of the Phoenix chapter, uh, having been the president for the past two years. But I've been engaged with BMI for pushing 20 years now at both uh, chapter levels and at the global level. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be back. And I concur with Dale. Um, congratulations on one year in and how many how many more to go? Yeah. Who knows? Ho- hopefully it doesn't end. We we had um, Andy Kaufman on the last show and he's working on year 10. So it'd be great if we could get that far as well. Right. I'm having a lot of fun doing it. So we'll see. Well, let's jump into some topics. Um, you know, it, it, it's great to have leaders, obviously, from across the U.S. with us. And, and Dale, you're joining us from Utah as well. So you're not here in studio with us. But I wanted to touch base first with you and get an understanding for this app circuit and and what you're doing with your innovation lab for PMOs. If you can dig a little bit deeper and to give the audience a little bit more about some of the innovation that you're coming up with. Yeah, sure. It's interesting that you ask about circuit because for us, we start with people first and then process and then technology. And so circuit as an app, as, as a product, is really designed to um, to take the sponsor and create an experience for the sponsor rather than the project manager or the project portfolio manager. So, so it's kind of like a starter rather than a starter home. It's like a starter project portfolio uh, tool for, for companies that are just just taking on project portfolio management as a as a practice. So we're talking about low maturity, recognizing that they need to gain more maturity, need to see all the projects in flight. It's a pretty basic tool. Uh, it's available for iOS and also for a web browser right now. And it uh, it shows all of the programs and projects that are currently in flight in a list view, as well as in kind of a, a timeline view so that the sponsor can, can see what are the major milestones uh, on each project and how do they interrelate across projects and programs. You can tap around and you can tap into individual milestones and see what the milestone is and the date that it's due. You can tap into a project and see more detail about that project. Uh, just at a high level, the, the app uh, records risks, issues, corrective actions, and then milestones by date. Um, so the idea is that you are, let's say that you're the sponsor, Joe, and I'm the, and I'm the, I'm your project manager and, I'm working on a project for you. Well, let's say I, I add a new risk or I add a new issue or I mark a milestone complete or I change the status of, of the project from green to yellow or red or, or whatever. You get a push notification. You can jump right into the app, see what's going on. And if you need more clarification, we can jump into a chat right away. You know, and you can ask me, hey, Dale, what, what's up? I saw that this went yellow. What, what's happening? I can give you better uh, better information in real time. You can provide your leadership you know your your executive sponsorship as the problems are occurring so we can we can put out the fires right now rather than having them escalate wait for the firefighting meeting you know sit down make you solve all all of our problems as a sponsor rather than us kind of pushing solutions to you in in more real time so the idea is that the app takes this number one problem according to pmi right the number one problem reason that projects fail is because of a lack of uh, executive sponsorship. We all know that, right? I don't need to preach that to you guys. And so we wanted to create a product that addressed that number one problem. Yeah. And it, so that's what we have in circuit. Yeah, and I, I think the the stats from last year's Pulse of the Profession, and I think February is when the, the new Pulse will come out, but we were 88 projects with actively engaged executive sponsors were 88% more successful than those without. So getting an application such as yours that focuses on the sponsors and is a definitely a unique view of trying to capture that engagement. So I, I'm interested, obviously, as we continue to talk, we'll learn more about your approach. And sure. as we mentioned, obviously, PMI, John, with you, in, in having led uh, the presidency here in Phoenix and also in Dallas in your past as well, people, right, because Dale talked about people, process, right. and technology – that's really what PMI is about, right? Isn't it, it, it making sure that the people within our profession have an organization they can lean on? Exactly. Um, and there's much more focus on that today than there has been. Um, 
PMI recently has kind of moved their strategy from being focused on the organizations to being focused on the practitioner, the the you and me that actually get out there and get the work done. And um, that's a great thing, in my opinion. Uh, having been a practitioner for about 25 years, mm-hmm. um, having focus on the practitioner is a good thing. It doesn't shy away from the sponsor um, because I've had that experience in the past also where it's it's hard to get that executive sponsor to stay on top of the project to help push it to fruition. Yeah. And I'm kind of excited to hear, you know, that there's at least an app out there now. There's There's been a few that have tried. So, um, but back to your original point, um, PMI's focus is now on us mm-hmm. as opposed to the organizations we work for. And I think that's going to be a real good thing for us. Can I ask a question about that? I don't want to jump in, but, but you know, this is a, conversation right I, I just i'm kind of curious john can you tell me more about what that means like shifting the focus away from the organization and toward the practitioner like how how did that's really you're really really intriguing to me how how is pmi shifting the view away from the org toward the practitioner well what we've seen so far is more focus on training and professional development for in pmi's case for the pmi members um not that that's not available to everyone but putting the focus of training and and development of the people and guiding them through their career, helping them get from, you know, um, a project scheduler to a project analyst, to a project manager, to a program manager. um, And hopefully in, in some cases, even at the, you know, like the C level of an organization Uh, by focusing on the practitioner and, not so much on the organization. Um, I, you know, I think that's going to be able to happen. I think PMI will change its focus, has already started changing its focus, actually, to put more emphasis on making the project manager a better project manager. Through that, organizations are going to prosper. Sure, yeah. And, and I guess with that, taking it from a national organization or international organization, rather, to the local level where you is now past president, but obviously had been president, there has to be a vision, right? I mean, how do you keep your local chapter aligned and how do you work through vision? How, how does that make sense for you? And, and what is it, what's the vision for Phoenix? Well, the vision for, for Phoenix right now is to be the place to go uh, for your, for your training and, um, and your socialization with other project managers to get together. The way we're changing our strategy here in Phoenix a little bit is expanding. We currently have dinner meetings. We have breakfast meetings. We, you know, we have a lot of things that we do, um, study groups, et cetera. But our our primary focus for getting the most people together one time is is a dinner meeting. What we're working on, we have three remote locations, and I know you're aware of one of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, We have a remote location in Buckeye. We have one in Chandler, and then we have one in Prescott. And uh, we're working our strategy over the next, let's say, four to five years is to expand those remote locations um, and try to reach out to more of those project managers that are out, let's say, in Yuma, Kingman, and get them engaged in PMI and help them enhance their careers and grow by the training that we're going to provide to them. Uh, One of the things that our last survey told us is that we're not doing enough professional development for people to get PDUs and, and to enhance their careers. And we're, we're going to focus on expanding our footprint, so to speak, and focus on having more availability of professional development. That's fantastic. And and I guess, Dale, uh, tying back into your question to John and then John's comments here, right? We're hearing what PMI locally in Phoenix is doing to try to engage them How important is it for project managers to get leadership skills and how does Swattage as an organization, whether it's your process, your consulting techniques or other tools you have, how are you working to better train project managers and organizations? Yeah, that's a good question. I want to kind of piggyback off of John's comment about focusing on the practitioner because I think we definitely need to focus on the practitioner, but I feel like we need to help the practitioner understand the business better. 
here's my, my experience. I was like a brand new project coordinator in an organization and I had been given a, a, a project that was, I thought I had a pretty clear commission to implement this new, um, this new software tool. And I had gone in to go pilot test it with some of the user groups and, and to make a long story short, the thing kind of blew up in my face and I went back to my leadership to say, Hey, well, basically what happened is that the people that complained about how, I, as a, as a totally green, you know, project coordinator had gone in to interact with them, Th- these people had escalated, you know, this, this issue up their leadership over to my department's leadership and back down to me. And nobody like really stepped in to say, oh, sorry, we gave him this commission when we told him to go do this. And, and so they kind of like left me out in the lurch. And so I thought in my career, I want to make sure that anyone who is an accidental project manager, anyone who is uh, taking on the responsibility of managing projects and implementing solutions that they are made aware of what's going on around them in a business environment. So there was a man uh, named Joel DeLuca. He was a professor, um, uh, I think at UPenn and, uh, he wrote this book called political savvy. And it's this, in this book, he talks about, uh, this method that he has for managing, uh, the kind of the politics of, of your business environment. And I, I read this book and I thought, this totally applies. This should be applied to project management. This should be like on every project manager's training docket, you know? Uh, and so I took, so I reached out to his organization. He actually passed away in 2009. I reached out to his foundation and said, hey, you know, I want to use this method to teach, to, to train project managers on how to be aware of kind of the, the politics of the, of the stakeholders in their, in their projects. Is that okay? Uh, and they said, yeah, that's fine. And so, uh, so we developed, based upon the Lucas book, book, this method for training project managers on how to analyze what we call their political landscape. It it takes the it takes kind of the the, the guesswork out of out of the stakeholder management and, and and helps project managers understand not only who are the stakeholders but what are their personal agendas relative to my project. Are they going to be a, are they going to support it or are they going to sabotage it? And how changeable are they? In the, and, and who, if anyone, can is, is the best person to influence this particular stakeholder to bring them across the aisle from silently opposing my project or, or verbally, for that matter, to, to supporting my to supporting my project. And so it's this political landscape management method for project managers. And so it's a, it's a training module that we developed. And so we, we take it to our clients and, and train our clients, project managers on them. And we, um, and, uh, it's amazing the comments we get from the trainees, like, oh my gosh, I have been working in project management for years and years. And I had never even considered, you know, and for this particular project right now that I'm working on, that I should, that I should approach this stakeholder in this way. And your political landscape management training has helped me to get, get gain new insights on how I should manage the business environment around my, my project. So that's one thing that we're doing to to help project managers know how to better operate in their business environment. Yeah. It's an interesting approach locally here in Phoenix. It was the 40th anniversary of the chapter last year. And Mm -hmm. we had a, a great series of guests who would come into the dinner meetings. And one was James Snyder and James had talked about kind of really the birth of PMI and how it started, I think he was with Georgia Tech uh, mm-hmm. and, and working on some projects there that were very uh, technically driven, but they needed to have more than just how to execute a project, right? It was, it was how right. do we bring together the skill sets necessary to, of course, execute a project, but to your point, Dale, how to understand within an organization, how can I navigate the waters of an organization to execute and get things done, to be a motivator, to be a a team player to be a leader and to me that was probably the most fascinating meeting from last year and then also we were fortunate enough on the show here to have harold kersner come on right who was a guest uh last year so john i, I kind of taking what dale had just talked about and then thinking back over the first 40 years of pmi phoenix right what were some of the highlights from last year and what did you take away from the guests that we had on last year and what's kind of some of the most memorable points well, it's it's certainly hard to beat James Snyder. Um, James is one of the five founding fathers of PMI, was there from day one. So that was probably our milestone meeting, I would say. Um, 
for our 40th anniversary. We kicked it off in January with Randy Black. Uh, and I mentioned Randy was on the board of directors of PMI, and he was our uh, he presented us our our plaque for being around for forty years. Um, and um, what I just found out recently is that Randy has been named the chairman of the board. Oh wow! For twenty nineteen, so that's um, fantastic. We we got a preview of the chairman of the board. Yeah. Um, and I'm working diligently to try to get him to come back to Phoenix, but. Um, it's going to be a lot tougher being in that role. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, but um, uh, we also, we did bring Mr. Kersner, Dr. Kersner, I should say, um, into Phoenix. Uh, he was here for a half a day seminar. And kudos to you for getting him on the radio. That's great. Great. Um, besides James, who, as you mentioned, had all of the history. He, he It was actually... Um, James kept, James Snyder kept all of the PMI records of all of the members in his kitchen for the first five years because there weren't very many members. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's, you know, there's over a, a million and a half members and um, it's, it's amazing what the, you know, what the organization has become and it's fully global. Uh, it's everywhere. But back to your original question, uh, we, we had Randy kick the year off. James was here in March. Um, we had Dr. James Brown, who's been here a couple of times uh, in the middle of the year in, in May. And he does it. He ties his into some professional development. So not only did, was he here for a dinner meeting, but he was also uh, gave a two-day class on leadership and project management and some of the politics of project management. Um, I'd like to make a comment on what Dale said. Some of us learned the politics of project management the hard way. Sure. By being a practitioner and out there trying to get something done and and you you eventually figure out the roadblocks and then you have to figure out a way around the roadblocks. And um that's just a you know, some of the things I've I've been able to do over the years. Uh, I didn't have an app or I didn't have a, a place to go to learn about it. I'd like to think that that's part of what we're going to be able to do over the next couple of years here in Phoenix is more professional development training around some of those roadblocks and how to help people enhance their career and how to help people get their projects done better. Yeah. And and I think, again, important to, to note this year, I believe, is the 50-year anniversary for PMI as a whole. So, again, a, a, we celebrated 40 in Phoenix. Right. Uh, it'll be 50 for PMI. And if, when we put that in the context of, of truly professional organizations, project management as a formal PMI kind of centered organization is very immature. So mm-hmm. it's great to hear organizations such as Dale's that's innovating to bring new techniques and practices to our, our group. Belinda Car- uh, Goodrich, who was on, I almost said Belinda Gar- Carlisle with the Go-Go's, but <laughs> Belinda Goodrich, who was on a few episodes back, also with Dr. Kirsten, right? She was sharing uh, her experiences in, as a trainer within the organizations and a keynote speaker going out to talk to organizations about emotional intelligence mm-hmm. and how we have to go beyond just managing project schedules, right? And we have to be a leader within the organization. So, Dale, with with keeping that kind of theme going, I mean, what if we think of project managers as leaders, right? And they have to right. politically navigate the waters. And what are some of the things that project managers can do to be better leaders? I think that you mentioned one of them, and that's emotional intelligence. It's a, it's a really good question. Right now, I'm putting together an outline for, well, I actually started writing uh, materials for a book called The Accidental Project Manager, and it kind of addresses that specific question. Like, what are all of the different aspects of PM leadership that that green project managers or that, or that people that fall into the profession need to know? Because you take this project manager, especially kind of a new one, right? Let's say you get someone kind of junior introduced into your PMO. And your PMO is already interacting with the executive team on various projects in your portfolio. Well, the executive, let's say it's the CIO or the CTO or whomever, has a lot of experience with leadership presence and, and leadership skills. The PM may or may not have that experience and may not even be aware uh, that he or she needs to develop that experience. So emotional intelligence, I think, is a, is a key one that helps us understand not only what are we feeling, but how can we pay attention to what others are feeling? 
and then adapt our communication, which is the next one, our communication to the situation with that specific person in that specific emotional state. If the project managers can recognize what other people are feeling and then adapt how they interact with those stakeholders based upon those feelings, they'll have a much greater chance of success. So emotional intelligence and then communication skills, the leadership presence, you know, sometimes you have a project manager come into the room and they have a kind of slouched posture or they're not using a, a, a confident voice to interact with the leadership team or with the project team. And it's interesting because those, those project stakeholders, they are like watching you, you know, they are waiting to see if they can trust you with their, their work, right? They have some kind of a business or a technical function to fill and they want to know if you're going to be able to, to safely guide their participation in the project. Otherwise they're not, they're not going to trust you. So um, let's see, emotional intelligence, communication. Uh, we talked about the political landscape stuff. So we know people's agendas. Uh, and leadership presence. I think if you started with those four things, you'd be pretty far ahead uh, as a leader in project management. What have I missed, John? What do you? What What have I missed that maybe you feel like is another key leadership skill? I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I, I can certainly totally agree on the communication part. Um, you cannot over communicate uh, when you're a project manager. It's um, it's key. And and just making that communication link with with your stakeholders, keeping them informed, that's that's key to getting getting them on your side. You know, you want your executive sponsors on your team, so you've got to you've got to coerce them to be on your team. And the best way you can do that, or one of the best ways you can do that, is communicate, communicate, communicate. And I would also add into that, right? Is we're doing projects for a specific business purpose. And understanding the uh, the political landscape is important, of course. Understanding how to communicate, of course, and social uh, and emotional intelligence, but also understanding and guiding the team as to what the cause and purpose and benefit of that project is. I think, to me, as project managers, we're too caught up in the technical components of managing a project, and not as much into what is the outcome and result we're trying to achieve. So, be, to me, being a, a good leader would include business acumen and understanding of the business goals that we're trying to accomplish. Oftentimes, we, you know, we had Mark Price Perry on talking about the business-driven PMO and how he would go into organizations and, and it may be important for them to be on time more so than on budget so they could spend excess. They were creating a business bias into the scope, time, and budget measurements. So it was okay to be over budget, because you were on time and on time was more important. I don't think we have enough yet within our industry to be able to understand how business and leadership is important for our PMs. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we, if we think about that a little bit more too, right. And, and dig in from a, from a PMI perspective, right. And again, John, I don't know how much you can add or, or not to this, but when PMI has our PMBOK and we, we go through those, or we saw them introduce Agile in this last edition. Correct. So they're expanding the reach there. Do you think there's a movement towards this focus of the practitioner and in, in the soft skills of project management and not just the technical skills of project management? I think there is. Um, I haven't seen it in writing yet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things that the local chapter, I can sp speak specifically for that. Sure. Um, the local chapter is going to focus much more on soft skills. Just as an example, our dinner meeting last last night was uh, on interviewing techniques mm -hmm. for those people that um, and uh, that honestly can use those. Sure. Um, and one of the things we talked about in the interviewing techniques was uh, your posture. Believe it or not, if you're in an interview, which is no different in a sense than uh, sitting in tr in the front of the room on your project team with your executive sponsors there and showing them that you are in command. Yeah. You are the project manager. You will get this done. Mm -hmm. um, but she, she spoke a little bit about posture and, uh, and body language and being assertive in the sense of um, being able to answer all the questions. That's another good point. Uh, when you're working with those executive, the executive leadership, you need to be number one, you need to be honest. 
bad news not delivered is really bad news. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you have to be honest. Uh, you have to be f- straightforward with with your re- reporting on where you are within the project. Um, and and again, you need you be, you've got to be able to communicate and communicate on the level that they want to want to hear. And Dale, I'm wondering, has Swattage done anything with the kind of evaluating project sponsors and project teams and PMOs as a whole? to be able to understand effectiveness, right? There's so much we're out there trying to see how to get better. It's, it's always a theme on almost every show is how can we improve our profession as individuals and as PMOs? What's, is Swattage doing anything in that space? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we have this, we have this method called the PMO um, value perception topography. It sounds really academic and scary, but it's really not. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. So we had a client this last summer, PMO of 37 project managers. So this is like, you know, enterprise level, several, several PMs. And they wanted to, they wanted to train their project managers, but they also kind of wanted to just build overall ma- maturity of the PMO. And so before we went into training, we did this assessment. And we, um, we asked the project managers to self-assess, to, you know, to measure themselves in terms of leadership skills. And we identified about eight different leadership areas for them to kind of rank themselves on. And then we also asked them to submit uh, or to kind of nominate 360 degree reviewers. So stakeholders with whom they were working on a current project, not just their favorite stakeholder that they used to work with on a project five years ago, but, you know, someone that they're working with right now. And then we sent another survey instrument out to those stakeholders, those reviewers, and we asked them. How, how do you feel like the, these project managers are performing in terms of these leadership areas? But then we also asked, you know, here are 15 basic project management practices. You know, like this project manager defines and documents scope. This project manager plans a, a project schedule, tracks, you know, tasks against the schedule, et cetera. So we had kind of just 15 basic questions about, you know, do you see this project manager? How consistently do you see this project manager? doing each of these 15 things how consistently do you see them defining and documenting scope etc so we first asked that question and then we also asked okay how important is it to you that this project manager defines and documents scope how important is it to you that this project manager gathers lessons learned for example and so then what we could do is we could take those two those two metrics and we could compare them and run a kind of a, a diff report and so then what happened, so what, what the result is, is that you now can have this heat map of, you know, these project managers, they are not doing things that their stakeholders really wish that they were, you know, or they're not doing them as consistently as their stakeholders wish they were doing them versus another set of another subset of the group, which was like pushing PM practices that in the eyes of their of their stakeholders, they didn't really add a lot of value. Um, and then you have like these little blips little like kind of spikes on the heat map. And then that tells the the PMO manager, like, no, these are the specific development opportunities for your PMO. We've got to bring this group into more consistency. We have to bring this group into better value communication. And we have to bring these individuals up in these areas. And so then we can kind of itemize and put together like the PMO development roadmap. By the way, anyone is welcome to go and kind of view a sanitized version of, of this. And so this is not just like, marketing material this is like a real deliverable for a real client it's just that the names have all been changed so that you don't know who who the, the individual pms are but uh if you go to swattage.com slash pmo value swattage is spelled with two t's so it's s-w-a-t-t-a-g-e.com slash pmo value you can actually download this the sanitized report and you can see the visual of what this value perception topography looks like so you kind of see like kind of the red area, the green area, the red area where people are not as consistent as the as the stakeholders want them to be, and the green area where they uh, where they're they're doing things, but the their stakeholders don't really feel like those things are really adding a lot of value. Anyway, and you can kind of see how we walk the client through. You know, here's how we gathered this these data. Here's how we concluded these these findings, and then here's here are our recommendations based upon what we've learned. That that is. I mean, that really opens up the eyes specifically of the PMO manager, right? So, I mean, we've talked about the PM and developing the PM skills, but the the project, so the the, the portfolio manager or the, the PMO manager director has a really unique role to play because they need to understand 
not only what are the individual like political agendas of the people on an individual project, they need to understand how is the overall PMO being perceived in this business. I was working on an account where they actually fired the PMO director and all the project managers because the, the project managers were being so, so rigid in their interactions with executive team that the executive team didn't feel like they could actually pursue their business strategy. And I just, I just cringe when I hear stories like that. I think if that PMO manager actually had had an understanding of what was going on in his business environment, maybe that PMO could have been saved and it could have added a lot of value to that business. And, and I wonder, John, you've uh, built and, and managed PMO before we were talking pre-show a little bit about that. Historically, there hasn't been a tool to help a PMO manager evaluate that way. We always look at the project level, right? How are each project performing? What, what's your thoughts uh, from a leader perspective on a tool similar to what Dale's mentioning or even just growing, maturing, and evaluating a PMO in general? Well, it sounds very interesting. I think a lot of PMOs in the past have failed. And part of that, at least from what I've, I was actually on the organizational project management advisory group for a couple of years. The failed, the failed PMOs, we, we put a lot of focus on that in that advisory group because you learn from mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what we found prevalent was, was the, the, the project managers and Dale just mentioned this, the project managers were very technical. They were very good at the technology part of project management, the scheduling, the planning, putting, getting things down on paper, meeting minutes, issue logs, risk logs, those kind of things. They were not very good at just being able to sit down and talk and understand the business. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to address that. I mean, you know, again, back to the Phoenix chapter, we're going to do more soft skill development. That's, you have to do that. Um, it's easy to learn the technical side of project management, but it's it's hard, a lot harder to learn the people side of it. Yeah, and having, you know, been fortunate enough to run some PMOs myself, what I've come to learn over time, and, and unfortunately I've got too many gray hairs in my beard than I wish I had, is that it's running a PMO, you're a business leader, you're not a project manager. And I learned that real quickly the first time I ran a PMO because I was an experienced project manager. They, I got promoted into a leadership role, but I hadn't been properly trained to be a business leader. So while I was a really, really good program and project manager, I was horrible the first time I ran a PMO because I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to treat it like a project. So I wish there were tools like Dale mentioned that we could have to be able to help us with those leadership opportunities. And it would be great, obviously, between PMI and, and private organizations. And if we did more for PMOs, right, we have this great PMBOK for the project manager. Right. But what do we have for the PMO leader? And and that's where an organization like mine with the PMO squad, we have the purpose-driven PMO where we're aligning the PMO to the business purpose of the organization or Mark Price Perry's business-driven PMO or swattage with, with the tool you've described, Dale. Uh, Laura Bernard in the impact workshops that she does to help PMO leaders be successful. There's so much more focus I think we need to do on getting PMOs to be business leaders mm -hmm. and leaders of a function within an organization and not completely be focused on just project execution. Exactly. Exactly. Just a comment uh, in my past, and I won't mention any, corporate names. Sure. But, uh, I did have the opportunity to work for a company that was... Give us some dirt. Nah. <laughs> was uh, very, very business focused. It was it was a, a treat for me to be able to sit down at the table like this, face to face with the, the business customer. In this case, they were our customer um, and say, tell me your problems. I mean, what is hurting you today? And then take that problem and say, give me a week and I'll come back to the same table with a solution. Mm -hmm. Give me another week and I'll come back to the same table with a solution and the cost and the timing. Sure. And, uh, and then get that buy-in from my customer. You know, let's do this. Let's fix this problem. And we, I 
we did that over and over and over, solve problems. Yeah. And yeah. it was a great chair to be in for a while. Absolutely. And, and I'm wondering, right, if we take what you described with Spottage and you've got this great example that everybody should go out and visit the link that Dale provided once again to, to take a look at this. I think it's important as an industry for us to see some of the innovation that's happening. But that's the that's the view of it. What's the second half of the story, right? What happened because of that? Dale, is, is, is there, what changes are taking place, right? What is the PMO manager doing with that data? What's the next step? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in this specific instance, and, and generally this is what should be done also, right? But, but uh, so we gather the data and then we itemize, like, you know, here are the recurring themes your PMs are kind of volunteering that they need training in these areas. Their stakeholders are, are also saying that the PMs need training in these specific areas. So let's tailor the training, a train, you know, a training and intervention to the needs that we've just discovered during this study. And so we did just that. We had, we kind of got a lot of the hard skills out of the way by having just an hour of online training on the basics of scope, schedule, budget, communication, and stuff like that. But then we got into the face-to-face -face sessions. We had 10 hours of, of focusing on some of these leadership areas, on, on leadership, leadership presence and communication and political landscape management. And, and, um, and then what we did is we kind of let the PMO manager go away with his team and come up with his own, um, his own PMO development roadmap. And then he sent it back to us for review. Uh, and then we have a period of six months for them to kind of implement these changes, the highest priority ch changes in their PMO development roadmap. And then we're going to go back actually in February next month and, and re measure. So we're going to take new data and compare, have the perceptions, the value that this PMO is adding, have those perceptions changed among the business stakeholders since we interviewed them last or since we collected or surveyed them last and um, is there anything else that we need to be considering uh, as we uh, as we gather those data? Even even just since we did the first round of, of assessment, we've already learned a ton. Like, well, next time we should differentiate between you know the stakeholders that are interacting directly with the PMs and people that are like a level removed, like you know a director who is not actually sitting in on that project every day, but but doesn't have like the the, the the personal relationship with the project manager and therefore doesn't have like the positive personal bias that maybe some of the reviewers had in our initial run through. And, and, and so if we could kind of see like these people have a positive bias toward the PMs, this other group has a negative bias toward the PMs. And we can kind of start to see more about perceptions of the value of the PMO change as we become more and more removed from the day-to-day -day interactions with the project managers. And I think what would be interesting, right? Maybe we have you on a, a year from now or, or more is those measurements are great. What, what has me intrigued is the overall performance of the PMO. And then when a new project manager joins them, are they instantly elevated because the culture of the organization and the PMO is, is, is performing better? Whereas, you know, I'll accept that challenge. You know, let me, <laughs> I'll gather data from these clients that we're working with. And this one in particular, they have metrics that are really important to them. You know, the kind of the big thing for them is, is, you know, the cost performance index and the schedule performance index. So looking at SPI and CPI, I would love to come back and say, you know, when we did the initial study, this was kind of their average cost performance index. And then since we've been working with them over the last 12 months, this is how it's changed over time. That, that would be interesting. Yeah, I, th I think that's ultimately what we're trying to do, right, is, is increase the value, the, the value prop. Mm -hmm. If we're at a deficit within a PMO where, you know, the average life cycle is two to four years. And that's because the PMO is running at a deficit and value provided back to the business. Steps like what you're doing there with Spottage can create a surplus. And with that surplus, you can have a couple of bad projects because overall your value is still positive to the organization. And what I'm trying to do with the show, of course, as we, I say this, I think almost every episode is to, it's E cubed or triple E, right? We're trying to educate, elevate, and execute. And ultimately, what are the tools and techniques we can do as a profession to be able to get us all better? But if we don't get the execute part, if we don't start seeing those results, then we, we carry with it the, the redheaded stepchild reputation and, and the negative connotation as the PMO is not necessary. Uh, but think, to, 
to get those results, I think, helps balance that to say, here's what we're finding with some innovation that we're doing within our industry. I think one thing that you just said is, is fascinating. The metric then should be, you know, if we can measure the value perception of a PMO, and if we can improve that perception by teaching leadership skills, et cetera, does that move the needle on the lifespan of the PMO? Like that would be a really fascinating data point. Yeah. If our if we're in deficit and the, the PMO only lasts two to four years, well, if we apply these methods, then the PMO can last four to six years instead because it's more aware of what's going on in its environment. Like that should be a true indicator of the effectiveness of, of these methods. I think CPI and SPI are good also, but like if if the PMOs are not, are are prolonged, not shut down, but that they're encouraged to continue because they are perceived as really adding value to that business. That should be our our indicator, our measuring stick. Yeah. I, again, I, so we'll we'll put you on the calendar for a year or so from now. We'll stay in touch and we'll see how that goes. And good or bad, we want to share the results. I mean, let's let's see what the data tells us. But you know, we we talked a little bit there about value. Mm -hmm. And value is one of the four V's that we have in in Phoenix PMI chapter, right? Vision, visibility, value, and volunteers. Right. John, can you dig into that a little bit and and explain why that's important from a strategy perspective for PMI Phoenix? Well, I think, you know, we start off with vision. You've got to know where it is you want to go. And, And you can tie this backwards in a sense to a PMO. You need to know what you're trying to accomplish. If you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, why are you going to be here? Absolutely. So we've set a vision. We want to we want to help all of our membership enhance their careers, and that's that's pretty good vision. Along with vision, you've got to be visible. You can't be invisible and and have your vision come true. You've got to be visible, which is one of the reasons I'm sitting in this chair today. And, and we're glad to have you with us. <laughs> So we're going to work on, uh, from a chapter perspective, we're going to work on being more visible, communicating more with our membership, communicating more with the community. Uh, we're um, doing, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but we're we're taking steps to make ourselves more visible in Phoenix. That, if we can accomplish those things, those are some of the value propositions that we bring back then to our membership. You know, just as an example, uh, if we're working with ASU, we're going to put a class together that's going to be run at ASU. That's, you know, that class on interviewing, just for an example, uh, is going to be valuable to some of our membership. So our goal is to bring value to all of our members, have a vision, be visible, and it's impossible for us to do any of that without our volunteers. Uh, Our volunteers are the crux of the chapter. Um, they're actually the crux of PMI. There's approximately 400 paid staff at PMI and over 11,000 volunteers throughout the world. It's amazing. So, um, the more volunteers we have, the more people that are interested in working with the chapter and and being a volunteer, the more value we're going to be able to do. And I think, I don't know if we're ready to make any sort of formal announcements yet, but I know... I've been, we, as I've talked about on air a couple times in the past, we've run a veterans project management mentoring program through the PMO squad and our partners, Vets to PM. And we've been in some good discussions with uh, the uh, group at PMI Phoenix mm-hmm. to see how there may be some collaboration that we can do there and uh, help each other and our veterans locally. Lots of military installations here in the local area that we want to go out there and serve better. So, Stay tuned. We may have some news in the the coming weeks or months about some additional partnerships that we may be forming there. That's great. For us, that's visibility. Absolutely. Well, uh, one last thing here with you, John, just to give you some more uh, of a bit of a plug for the chapter and what you have going on. You had talked about the different uh, locations that you serve throughout Arizona and dinner meetings. Uh, but there's more than that, right? There's breakfast meetings, study groups, et cetera. Right. What are some other ways that local members can be engaged in the different functions that you have going on? Um, local members of the chapter? Yes. Yeah. yeah. For instance, yeah. we have the, the Chandler breakfast meeting. 
I'll be speaking in the Northwest breakfast right. meeting coming up in a few weeks and, and stuff like that. Oh, good. I may attend that one. Then. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be up into your neck of the woods. It'll it's be easy be commute closer. for you. Yeah. It's going to be closer. We've got a lot of things going. We, um, I have to stop and think for a minute, but. Another example was we, we, um, for, for Veterans Day last year, I ran a local 5K that was a veterans focused veterans right. 5K and the local PMI chapter put together a team that participated in that. Right. And I think it goes back to your visibility and your vision and being mm-hmm. in the community. So there's, there's events that you put on, whether they're regular, like a dinner meeting or a breakfast meeting right. and study groups, training for PMP, the agile up function. Yeah, we'll have another one of those this year. Uh, which was a fantastic group uh, that was uh, Dimitri and Warwick were both former guests, happened to be presenting, and it was great for me to attend that and learn. And we're going to have Danielle from Amex on a future show coming up here in a couple of months. Right, that's what I heard. So, yeah, lots of great things that PMI is doing locally within our community and, and ways for folks to be engaged. Mm-hmm. Uh, of um, course, nationally as well, right? Right, right. Yeah, and we've got a few coming up. Uh, we're working right now on trying to put together uh, with another volunteer organization um, a golf tournament because we haven't had one for quite a while. It's hard to beat the golfing in Arizona. I don't know if we're the golf capital of the world, but we got to be pretty close. We've got to right? be pretty close. So that's fantastic. I I, I just love what what PMI stands for. I'm I'm. Uh, um, not a traditional PMI fan and Pimbach preacher and, and all that, but I, I know it's important for our industry to have a strong PMI and to have us grounded and rooted on and give us guardrails of how mm-hmm. as practitioners we need to go out there. So I'm glad that we get to have you on the show and, and learn about the chapter and how you're trying to help our members and the changes that are going on within the organization. Of course, there'll be a new president. and right. uh, So a year of change in PMI as we hit year number 50. Exactly. And so we're, we're coming up on our time, right? And obviously we want to give Dale and you, John, a, a chance to sign off and say thank you for being with us or me to say thank you for being with us. So Dale, is how can anybody reach you? I know you've given one site, but is there any way folks can reach you and any last items you want to share with the audience before we sign off? Thank you. Well, thanks for having us. Um, it's been great. It's been great to have this conversation and great to meet um you john um so there's the 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 swattage.com slash pmo value page where people can see the 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 topology that we talked about or the rather the topography that we talked about and then also uh if people just uh email me at dale at swattage.com they can get a hold of me that way i'm really active on linkedin so if you search for dale richards swattage on linkedin you can find me there I'd love to connect with anyone, you know, uh, any practitioners out there, uh, because I want to learn more about you and your PMOs and what you're doing with them and the challenges that you're facing and and how we might be able to help you. So that's it. Great. Thanks so much. And John, how about uh, how can folks be in touch with you and and PMI Phoenix and anything that you want to share with the audience before we sign off? Uh, Certainly. Um, Easiest thing is to go to our website, which is www.phx dash pmi.org uh, it's got our calendar out there all of our upcoming events breakfast meetings dinner meetings training etc um, we're also on linkedin we've got a linkedin uh, presence and we have facebook um, and twitter and that's that falls under our marketing group so um, who was here with me the last time yeah so those are that's you know i w- always tell people when when i talk to them to go to our website Yep. Um, you'll find out everything that's going on and then you can dig a little deeper. And, and of course, if you have any questions at all, just email the past president. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And Nicole's do, and Nicole and team yeah. are doing a great job of the marketing. And, and yep. uh, I've seen over the past year, a big improvement in that space. So look forward to that to continue. Thank you. So Dale and John, thank you obviously for being on the show. Um, and also want to remind everybody that we are live the first and third Thursday each month. There'll be an exception to that. Next month on February 7th, we're not going to have a show. I'm also a board member of the SIM chapter here in Arizona, and we have a HMG strategy CIO summit taking place that day. So I will be 
uh, participating in that summit. And uh, with that, our next show will be February 21st. We're going to have Kevin Jacobs, PMO leader here locally, and Jan Schiller on the show. So I look forward to hearing from Kevin and Jan. Also want to remind everybody that these shows are recorded and you can subscribe to the Project Management Office Hours podcast on Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, or whatever your favorite podcast platform is. I think last time I checked, uh, we were number one project management podcast on iHeartRadio. And I don't know what that means other than I get to say that, and that's kind of cool. Someday, maybe we'll get the number one spot on Apple Podcasts. That's the uh, the grand prize that everyone's going after. Also want to thank our sponsors once again, the PMO Squad. The year uh, 2019 for the PMO Squad is going to be focused on building and implementing project management offices for organizations with our proprietary purpose-driven PMO approach. Uh, that's tied to purpose, measure, and optimize. Those three together with purpose at the core helps us deliver PMOs that last longer than two to four years. So that's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Mm-hmm.